Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Den of the Drake. Other dragons hoard gold while I hoard internet cringe. Here at Den of the Drake, I like to pride myself in... Hey, Drake, we're out of milk. Can you drive me to the store to go get some? When did you get a tank? Well, that's simple, little buddy. I'm one of more than 100 million people who have been playing World of Tanks, which is now free to play for PC. The game has over 600 different models of light, medium, and heavy tanks, all modeled with historical accuracy in mind. So gameplay feels like you're inside of a real tank. Drake, we are inside of a real tank. That didn't even come close to answering my question. Wait, is this a sponsorship? Hey, there's a parking spot. Hey, hey, hey! That was my car! You better have some good insurance, man! Oh, yeah, I got it for you right here. Oh, real funny. Do you think this is some kind of game? As a matter of fact, I do. And that game is World of Tanks. I've been earning experience and upgrading this old steel beast so I can drive her through deserts, industrial zones, open fields, forests, and even doing my best Skyrim horse impression and taking this baby up the sides of mountains. With over 40 arenas, there's no shortage of places to test your metal. Yeah, 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 that's all great, pal. But what do you plan to do about my freaking car? About your car? Nothing. But what I can do is offer you an exclusive deal to get you started in World of Tanks. Just click the link in my description and use the promo code TANKMANIA to get a 7-day premium account, 250,000 credits, the premium tank Excelsior, look at how cuddly that little guy is, and three rental tanks that you can use for 10 battles each. Alright, I got the milk. Let's blow this popsicle stand. Remember, World of Tanks, tons of rewards, link is in the description! So, did anyone else see the dragon run over my car with a tank, or am I just going f***ing insane? Now that I've made enough money to add a tank to my toys meant to piss off the government collection, I think it's about time we move on to what you all came to see. The story I have for you today stars a player who made the horrible mistake of making her character just a little bit animal-like, leading to a furry creep plotting a nonsensical romance in a way that only the most fuzzy of degenerates could ever find acceptable. Now, without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right into the horrifying world of r slash RPG horror stories. Enjoy. This week's story comes to us from user CurseofDM21. And it's titled, But I Thought You Were a Furry Too. How My Character Avoided a PC's Advances the Only Way a Rogue Can Do It. This happened not long before the virus of unknown origins lockdown. I am a forever DM, but since I didn't have a party at the time, I decided to try and be a player. Last time I was a player, something happened that urged me to become a DM. But time had passed and I decided that this was a good time to be a player again. But that is another story. Today I will tell you about that one time a player tried to make a stealth mission into another kind of mission. Trigger warning, there is an in-game attempt at assault. I applied to a campaign. It was the first time that I would play online. The campaign was a homebrew world using the 5e system. The only thing that I was imposed on was that I needed to choose between being a cleric or a rogue, since the party was short on both of those classes. I was happy to choose rogue, and so my rogue tiefling was born. Her name is Kawime. Pronunciation, Kiva. How? Okay, I may be Mr. Big Dumb Dragon Man here, but can someone explain to me how that is pronounced Kiva? Okay, back to the story. She is a tiefling rogue that used to be part of a gang until she was used as a scapegoat to cover for another member and was beaten to her presumed death. This left her badly wounded to the point that her wings needed a considerable time to heal. I wanted her to have wings, but knowing that it would be overpowered, we agreed that her wings would be healed at higher levels. 
The thing is, is that she couldn't recall exactly why this happened to her, and that the DM could come up with something as a surprise. She was healed back and now worked with another player's character as assistance to an NPC that the party would eventually meet. But I wanted my tiefling to look more bat-like, to apply some flavor so her face resembles somewhat of a human bat face, but not scary so people wouldn't get frightened. I drew her and pitched her to the DM and she agreed. This is important to the story. So the day of the session arrives, and the party consists of five other players. Names have been changed. Dave, a human barbarian. Lizzie, a high elf wizard. Josh, a gnome fighter. Matt, a drow cleric of Elistray. And finally, Nick, the problem player. A monk fox, reskinned tabaxi. Dave, Lizzie, Matt, and Nick are in a cell, imprisoned for being suspects in a current incident. They make their introductions and they have been released, but told not to leave the city because the culprits have yet to be apprehended. They are intercepted by a private investigator who is working to solve the case, but needs more people to succeed. And so when he escorts them to his residence where me and Josh are waiting, the detective introduces us as their assistants and new colleagues. I was making my introduction, and I noticed that Nick seemed very enthusiastic when I mentioned her bat traits. The others introduce themselves to Josh's character and mine, and we begin to officially work as a party. During the session, Nick's character was always close to Kiva, and was very friendly towards her. Kiva is, in fact, not much of a social character, so she remained civil towards his character and the others, save for Josh's character. This was, of course, because they knew each other for quite some time before the rest of the party arrived. After the first session, Nick started to message me. He talked about his character and how good and interesting it was, and so on and so forth. I told him that I was making a sketch of my character, and he asked me to show it to him. He said that she was very attractive, and was happy that I was in the game. Now, I didn't think much of it at first, but then I would find out why he was so enthusiastic about my character. Session 2 arrives, and Nick's character tries to be around Kiva as much as possible. He would offer to buy her beer at the tavern or to keep her company when she had to go buy something or to find information. Anything, you name it, the fox was virtually glued to Kiva for whatever reason. Whenever I told him that my character would go alone, he would reply with, we are a team, and we have to help each other. Something could happen, and uh, you might need someone to save you. Yeah, like I'm going to need reinforcements to buy a health potion in the store next door. But, oh well. He tried to make my character talk more about herself or her past. The thing is, is that Kiva is a bit distrustful, and is the type of character that wouldn't even talk about how her breakfast was with someone who was still just an acquaintance. He would try to ask her more questions, and she would just answer with a plain, Yeah, nope, sure. To put it shortly, her personality was a lot like Hellboy, but more quiet. I wanted her to slowly warm up to the party as time passed, and Nick was relentlessly making me more and more annoyed. He also seemed annoyed that my character was closer to Josh's. At one point, his character tells mine that he finds her cute, and that they should get to know each other better. But Kiva, being herself, told him that she was flattered, but she didn't feel the same. Especially since in-game, these characters had only known each other for just a few days. We end the session after a battle, after which he messaged me asking me why Kiva hasn't opened up more to his character. That he has been nothing but nice to her, and she was acting cold and distant. I told him that my character just needed some time to warm up to others before fully trusting them. He told me that she could trust him, that she should be more friendly, and that her behavior was unjustified, and that you should make it so that they can get along just fine. I told him that Kiva is my character, and that he should only worry about playing his. Ah, uh, here we go, here we go, here we go! The little red flags are starting to trickle out of the earth like little demonic fursuit-wearing groundhogs. 
Look, there's never a scenario where you should just say to another player, your character needs to do this, and expect it to go well. Imagining going to college, and on day two of class, you turn to the hot chick sitting next to you and say, Hey, why are you being so cold and distant? I think your behavior is unjustified and you should trust me by now. That shit is a guaranteed way to make sure she never says another word to you ever again. So, what makes a D&D table any different? Just like in real life, you don't get to dictate the behavior of others. Because, wait for it, they have their own personalities and motivations completely independent of yours. I mean, you can talk to players outside of the game and say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if yada yada yada. But never is it okay to just straight up tell someone what their character needs to do. Look. The phrase, it's what my character would do, is already a slap in the face. The phrase, it's what your character would do, is an uppercut to the nuts. Don't uppercut people in the nuts. Session three arrives and we get a new mission, which ends in a battle. At the very end of the session, we found out that an important NPC in the campaign was in cahoots with the current antagonists of the entire story. It was mentioned that this lead might help us stop the web of corruption in the city. We needed proof of the NPC's involvement, however, so we agreed on a stealth mission and Kiva, being a rogue, was the obvious choice. Nick. I offer to go with her, he says. Matt. I can help. I can make someone invisible, so... Nick. No, we can do it ourselves. Plus, you might need the spell slot. Matt. I guess, but... Me. Wait. No. It's just gonna be an in-and-out mission, and with invisibility, I think I can make it. I just need someone else to alert me if someone is coming or to create a distraction. Lizzie. It's the house of a notorious NPC. We are gonna need everyone just to be safe. Nick. No, me and LP can do this alone. You can just wait for us here. Josh. No way, man. If you two go alone, you might get killed. Nick kept arguing that we could do this alone, but everyone and myself knew that a plan like that was suicide. We agreed on the following. Me and Nick would go into the house, while someone would distract the NPC at a ball he was attending at the moment, and the others would keep watch and alert us if anything happened. I really didn't want Nick accompanying me, but I just told myself that it wasn't going to be that bad. This is a stealth mission after all, what could possibly happen? Warning, here is where things turn south. Mentions an attempt of assault. Session 4 arrives and the plan is set in motion. I'll spare you the details and go to the important part. A few very lucky rolls and we get the papers that proved the NPC's involvement. We had to fight with some animated objects that acted like some sort of security system, but we did it! The dice were on our side. We only needed to get out unnoticed to successfully finish the mission. Now we are finally out of the NPC's residency and in his garden. Freedom is at hand. We get to a wall that has bushes and some trees. Then Nick pushes his luck and tries to pull this move. I was about to roll when he asked, Are we hidden enough? The DM replies, Yes, the bushes and trees cover you just enough, I guess. Good, he said. I pin Kiva to the wall. And rolls for it. He succeeds. Wait, what? I exclaimed. Dude, we are about to escape. What are you doing? Nick says, I think we can celebrate our success now. <laughs> and he describes how he tries to grab my character's tail to turn her around. The DM and the rest of the players are dumbfounded. Lizzie told him to quit it and to get out. Dave and Matt couldn't believe what was happening and Josh was asking if he could do something, but he wasn't close enough to actually see anything happening. The DM was still thinking what to say or do. And before she could say anything, I say, I, I, I try to free myself. Nick tries to object, but the DM lets me. I am free now. And then I say, I, I cut one of his fingers. There is a small pause and she finally says, okay, roll for it. Nick tried to make the DM stop, but I rolled and got a natural 19, 
rolled a d4 for damage, and it was done. I describe how my character swiftly cuts one of his fingers. I shove my dagger into his character's face and tell him to shove it up his ass, and then make Kiva leave the scene. Nick finally makes it out of there, but not before the DM describes how some guards saw some movement in the garden and were coming over to investigate. Nick used a cloth to cover his hand so the blood didn't make a trail, and used different paths to avoid suspicion. The two players that attended the ball finally came back, and the session ended sooner than usual. I blocked Nick after that. Nope, uh-uh. Unacceptable. This is exactly why when people see a fox icon pop up in a Discord server, the ingrained red flags start to pop up in their brains. Funnily enough, the normie reaction to furries reminds me of the instinctual reaction that humans have towards spiders. Most spiders have venom that's way too weak to be of any harm to humans, but the few ones that do have instilled an instinctual fear across an entire species. It's gotten to the point where I wonder if the next generation will evolve an overwhelming sense of terror when in the presence of Tony the Tiger and the f***ing Charmin Bears. And here's the most tragic thing. Like how most spiders are harmless, most furries I've met are genuinely cool people. Look, I'm not a furry, but by the sheer virtue of being a cartoon dragon on the internet, it's a bit of an understatement to say that I see a few of them skulking around in my corner of the internet. A vast majority of furries that have made their way to the channel have actually managed to lessen my unease towards furries a bit. Only for the few who fit the stereotype perfectly to smack me back to square one. Of course, I'm exaggerating for the sake of entertainment value. But frankly, the people who say that bad furries are a myth and are a hoax made by the trolls TM are honestly just as bad as the trolls themselves. They're two extremes that do nothing to address the issue and end up making the internet a slightly more uncomfortable and annoying place to inhabit. And as for the DM. This sort of shit should never have been allowed to have been taken this far. As the DM, the second that you hear, I grab her by the tail and turn her around, you look that furry f right in the eye and say, no, you don't. What you definitely don't do is try to turn something like this into an opportunity for role play. Why on God's glorious earth is Nick even allowed to roll for something like this? Why was Kiva forced to roll to get out of a situation that no one wanted? Why are you putting the fate of a PC in the hands of random chance? What, pray tell, DM, was your plan if Nick rolled a natural 20 on his grapple? You are the DM. You have complete and perfect control over everything that happens in the game. So it's pretty sus that the DM would even humor something like this. Just gross. Really, really gross. Later, I messaged the DM and told her that I wasn't going to continue in the campaign. She tried to convince me to stay, that she was sorry that happened, and that she would talk to Nick to stop behaving like a creep. But at this point, I wasn't going to comply. I tell her to tell the others that my character decided to leave in the middle of the night and fix her memory somewhere else with the permission of her employer. She tried to convince me again, and I asked her if Nick was going to be there. She said yes, that they were longtime friends and that it was just hard for her and the other two players to just boot him from the party. So I say thank you, but no. She then told me that Nick was confused because he thought that I might be a furry because of my character that others, I don't know who exactly, suspected that too, and she confirmed that Nick, in fact, is a furry. No, for the record, I am not a furry. I told her no again. She told me that she understood where I was coming from, apologized one last time, and left. I felt a bit guilty. Maybe I could have handled it better than what I did to his character. Like, just leave the game right there in that moment. Truth is, I am nothing like my character. I don't like conflict. I played her the way that I thought she would react, and I just wanted out. After that, I told myself that I wasn't going to play a female character ever again, or anything that even looked 1% closer to an animal. Since then, I have come back to the seat of a DM. I'll end this by saying something that a friend of mine told me after I narrated this story to her. 
as I finish the story and how I wasn't comfortable playing female characters again or with animal traits. She tells me this. Being a female character of any kind wasn't the problem. He was. Go play female characters if you want. Don't play victim. Next time someone tries to do that to any of your characters, be sure to cut more than just the one finger. Maybe the last thing she said was a bit much. But if something like this happens to you, don't be afraid to speak out. Either pause the session, talk to the DM, or anything. Just don't let this keep you from playing the characters that you want. Also, I do know that not all furries are like that, but this did not give me the best impression. TLDR. I make a bat-like tiefling character and the furry problem player thinks this is a sign to force his fox character onto mine, in hopes that I might be a furry too. Ends up with one of his fingers getting cut off and I leave the campaign, since the DM wanted to keep the problem player because she is longtime friends with him. End of story. But I thought you were a furry too! Okay, and what if she was? There's another thing that Opie is that comes way before her being a furry, and that is her status as a person. It literally does not matter if Opie is a furry or not. To just assume that someone is open to your sex pest shenanigans because they might have the same interest as you is just an appalling sense of entitlement. Being a furry is supposed to be a hobby, right? Could you imagine just some dude walking up to a chick and saying, hey, I'm an amateur aboriginal basket weaver. You look like a woman who knows her way around a basket. We're bang, okay? Now before we go, let's take a look at this week's Gallery of the Drake. This week's fan art comes from viewer Captain Bendy Pants and depicts the process of creating perfection. For those of you who are unaware, the most recent attempt by me to evade the federal government came in the form of a full magical metamorphosis, which can be witnessed in the opening of this video. You all seem to really enjoy it, but the FBI, not so much. FBI, open up the door! Ugh, for the love of God, I'll be right there, hold on! God, these Girl Scouts get more aggressive every year. Thank you again, Captain Bendy Pants, for submitting your art. If you want to see your fan art featured in Gallery of the Drake, be sure to send it to the email in my About section. Fan art is my favorite part of doing YouTube, and it means the world to me that I can inspire artists like you to create artwork like this. With the story over and artwork displayed, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you feel like supporting the channel further, my Patreon link is in the description. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you next time in the Den of the Drake.